and grab a coupon before you leave. Or come see me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming today. I know Big D's is really excited. This is kind of the first of the vet seminar that we're going to start doing through the spring. So you get me today for the first one for broodmares and foaling. Um, Dr. Rangel, who's lovely photo is over there. Um, we'll be here in February to do emergencies. So we're really looking forward to that. And it sounds like we're going to continue doing the live streaming and in-person stuff as long as things stay under wraps. So today we're going to be doing broodmares and foals. And so I tried to cleverly title this babies, mamas, and their dramas. So if you could all laugh now, cause that's <laughs> funny. Thank you. Um, and so we're going to talk about, I'm going to kind of start, um, the seminar with going through like pregnant mares and some normal things and then kind of the meat and potatoes of this is we're going to talk about foaling and what to expect from kind of the beginning to the end. We're going to go over a little bit of like pregnancy complications and then we're going to end with some full things and full emergencies and things that I want you guys to be aware of leaving here today to say okay I feel prepared right as best as you can for what's coming because I'm sure how many of you guys have expectant mares in the crowd yeah so we have a lot to look forward to okay. So um, I'll try to stop in some spots and ask if anyone has questions, but this is, I'll be honest with you, could be a little dense in section. So if you say anything that you're like, hold on, just raise your hand, this is gonna be informal and I encourage questions. Okay, so first let's talk about some normal stuff. This is what everyone wants me to give a hard number on. How long is my mare gonna be pregnant? And that's the grand question. Um, if you read textbooks and you read all the resources, people will tell you 320 days, 340 days, 350 days, 345 days. And the question is, is we kind of have a window, but every mare is gonna be a little different. And so the average is about 340 days, and then we say plus or minus 10 days. What's interesting is that mares, once they kind of establish what their foaling time is going to be, they're pretty consistent. So if you have a broodmare that foals, you know, it's good to keep track because if she foals at 350 days one year, that's probably going to be where she foals at, you know, barring you no know, complications or other things for the rest of her broodmare term. So that's pretty interesting. So I encourage people to keep track of that. Um, it is important to know that the mares have to be pregnant for at least 300 to 320 days for that, that foal to be viable when it's born. So there are some things that cause what we call late term, meaning later on in their pregnancy, but also not late enough for the foal to be viable. And we need to make sure that those foals are within that window. And then there are tons of fun, just like in humans, where you can open a little app and say, oh, my baby's the size of a grapefruit today. There's tons of fun resources out there like that for foals. I really like the one from Guelph University um, up in Canada. So if you Google like equine pregnancy wheel, it's like the first one that shows up. And so you can type in your mare's breed date and then it will calculate out, you know, her foaling window and it'll, you can click through all the months and it'll be like, today your foal is growing hair. <laughs> You're like, yay. <laughs> so those are fun things to kind of keep track of where the mares and foals should be at. And so it has a section for the foal and it has a section for the mare. And those are really helpful to kind of give you guidance lines of where we should be at. All right, now into the fun stuff. So preparing for foaling. I'm going to kind of go through a couple of steps to work you up. Um, but the first thing that is important is to determine when your foaling window is. Kind of all of the things I'm going to mention next, you have to know when the mare is going to foal before you can like appropriately prepare. And so again, there's tons of resources. It's really hard if you say, oh, well, she was bred on May 12th. It's hard to count like calendar days. So make your life easy. <laughs> go find something where you can just plug the date in and find out when her foaling window is supposed to be. Once you have that information, your second step is to kind of figure out the milestones for your mare care. And part of this, like I like to think that I help like my clients establish this. So when we like breed mares and especially my first visit with someone, you know, I say, all right, what are your expectations? When are you hoping to have a foal? You know, here's what I recommend from a veterinary standpoint. And then here's what's kind of the normal for, for looking at breeding mares. And so a couple of the big things everyone likes to talk about are obviously like your pregnancy checks, right? So so there are some people who are okay with kind of the unknown side of things and will breed the mares and kind of say, see you in 11 months. And, you know, I don't recommend that, but it certainly can be done. Um, we like to at least say, you know, confirming pregnancy at 14 days uh, from breeding and then again in 30 days because that window of like zero to 30 days is one of the most kind of sensitive times for early embryonic loss, essentially where the mares can become pregnant, but then lose the pregnancy. And so we like to verify that at 30 days, like the fetus is implanted in the uterus and we know that the mare is still pregnant. So we recommend those pregnancy checks. 
And then again, at 90 days, to make sure she's continued out of kind of that early embryonic loss period and she's still pregnant. My next big thing is nutrition and body condition scoring, which is a big topic, whether you're talking about pregnant mares or just horses in general. Um, but something that I think a lot of people get excited about is they're like, all right, the mare's pregnant, she's eating for two. <laughs> And I wish we could all use that excuse. But what the reality is, is that, right, horses are genetically designed to live out on the plains where they get like prairie grass <laughs> and a creek every once in a while. So they are actually shockingly good at metabolism in early pregnancy and, and maintaining their body condition. A lot of people, I think, overfeed the mares a lot in the early pregnancy, which, you know, it the, obviously the horses need to be in appropriate body condition. We don't want these girls carrying a pregnancy while they're really skinny, but we also don't want them to be overweight. There's a lot of research, um, and I'll shout out to Dr. Teresa Burns, who was one of my mentors at Ohio State and may be watching today, but she's done research um, on insulin in horses, and more specifically, um, I just watched a lecture of hers with insulin in pregnant horses. Um, and so just like in humans, I'm sure if you guys have ever had kids or know people that have kids, like we experience gestational diabetes. Horses very rarely get true diabetes, but they can become less sensitive to insulin in their blood. And so if we are feeding these girls and they're you know, overweight and overproducing insulin, and then they're naturally losing that sensitivity to the insulin, we can predispose them to issues with insulin, just like in people, I'm sure you guys have maybe heard like equine metabolic syndrome thrown around or insulin dysregulation where you know they can be more prone to things like founder and other conditions associated with high insulin that the tissue can't absorb. So the take home for all of that is that I want these girls to be at a good body condition score but not overweight in early pregnancy. Their nutritional needs crank way up the second they start kind of producing milk and especially when they are producing milk and the foals are consuming the milk. So these girls will start making their milk for their foal at about month 10 to month 11 of their pregnancy. And so that's when we kind of want to start ramping up their nutrition. Once the foal hits the ground and is now consuming that milk, their nutritional needs go through the roof. And so a lot of times I'll recommend that that's when we switch foals to like a growth formula or making sure that they're getting good forage and fiber and fat supplementation. Um, a lot of people will choose to feed alfalfa when they're lactating because it's a good source of calories, but also, you know, a nutritionally balanced calorie. And so we just have to watch them. And one of the things I recommend is that everyone learns how to body condition score. So um, assessing body condition, I think every horse owner should know how to do this, but it's really important in ma mares because their body condition score can change. It almost sometimes seems like overnight. Like you look at them one day, you're like, oh, they look great. And then two days later, you're like, oh, did she get skinny last night? So I like people to be able to keep track of this. And so you'll see on the right, these are the zones of a horse that we'll kind of use. Like if I go out to see a horse and I'm assessing body condition. So the crest of the neck and then behind the shoulder, everyone likes to look at rib cover which I tell people if you're just looking at the rib cover you can miss a lot of things you know horses can you can see their ribs all down their back and then they can have fat in these other areas that's kind of hiding and so you should do you know full kind of hands-on you know take the blankets off take a look at them <laughs> and get a good idea at where they're at we score these guys on a score of one being very very skinny to nine which is morbidly obese and I like especially going into winter in Ohio I like my horses to be between a five and a six with my broodmares probably on the six side. And so what that means is they should have adequate rib cover and small amounts of excess fat around the crest of the neck, on the tail head and behind the shoulder. But again, I don't want them obese. All right, my last two points on Maricare, vaccination schedule. Um, we personally as a clinic recommend that horses get vaccinated with a Pneumabort product, which is the vaccine that protects these girls against herpes one abortions. If you guys watch the news, especially if you're in like large breeding operations or show operations, you've probably heard of herpes causing you know respiratory disease and the neurologic disease. But the herpes strain one can cause abortion and we have a good vaccine for it. So I recommend that we vaccinate these horses. The manufacturer recommends that we vaccinate them at months five, seven, and nine of their pregnancy. However, we will recommend vaccinating them at three months as well in very high risk areas. You know, if there's a lot of horses in and out of the barn. And then the other big milestone for vaccination is at month 10, when they're starting to make their colostrum and their first milk for the full, we vaccinate them about against uh, the equine, American Association of Equine Practitioners core diseases, which is your Eastern and Western encephalitis, West Nile virus, tetanus, and rabies. So the things that, you know, your average horse is getting vaccinated for yearly, 
we vaccinate these girls at 10 months so that you know as they're vaccinated and their immune system starts ramping up they're putting those products of their immune system called antibodies into their milk for their full because your foal is not born with an immune system so the mare has to give it to them and we're going to cover that in a little bit but this is kind of the teaser for that and vaccination helps them get a good first immune system then finally deworming everyone has strong opinions on deworming but what we do know about worms and especially these strong giles that can affect horses is they're very smart small creatures um, and we know that they experience something that is a known phenomenon called periparturient, which means around birth rise. And so the worms and the parasites can actually detect that the mares are pregnant and about to give birth. And they go, hey, she's going to give us a new host to infect. So they'll actually crank up their egg production right before the mare is about to foal. And so her fecal egg count or how many eggs are in her feces can actually skyrocket around foaling. So I do recommend that we deworm these girls around foaling about 60 to 30 days before to make sure that we're covering some of our bases in terms of not giving these foals a whole bunch of parasites that are going to come in when they're you know small and susceptible to these things. All right we're finally on to step three preparing your barn. A lot of people don't think about this but it's very important. I'm going to talk a lot as we get into kind of the foaling process about stress um, and so I like to kind of decrease these girls stress as much as possible and so one of the first things I do is about 30 to 60 days away from our foaling date, I get them set up in their new house where they're going to foal. So, you know, if you're in a standard barn with 12 by 12 stalls and you've got a different setup for foaling, I want to move these girls a little bit early so they can kind of get acquainted to their new home and they know that like, this is my house now, this is where I'm going to have my foal and life is good. I also recommend that about 30 days before we really start monitoring the mares. And so we're going to talk a lot, right, about how to detect when the mares are about to foal, and that's the magical question. But one of the things that I like to watch for are monitor their attitude. You know, these girls that are late pregnant and really big, they can get pretty uncomfortable and kind of cranky sometimes. So it's a good indicator that like things are happening and she's coming through the late term of her pregnancy. Um, I also will tell people to start looking at their udders. And you don't have to go down there and go on like a scientific expedition every day like measuring her udder but it's good to look and see like where is she at and we'll talk about udder fill and some of the other things that happen there but again just knowing where we're at is always helpful then I recommend that people start to assemble their folding kit which we'll talk about next and then I like mares to be fold out on straw shavings as we all know because we probably all clean stalls there's lots of small particles that can get everywhere you know you go home at the end of the day you take your shoe off and it's full of shavings the last thing i want is the full to be full of shavings and the mare to be full of shavings because i can imagine that would be uncomfortable so the nice thing about straw is it you know it's fairly absorbent it's nice and plush for the full to lay in too um, it doesn't provide as much friction and cause like rubs like some of the, sh the shavings can uh, and then the straw isn't going to you know when the mare's foaling and obviously you know things can track up and in the straw is less likely to do that so we always or the yeah the straw is less likely so i recommend that we get these girls off of your traditional wood shavings and then if you're using some kind of full alert system in your barn which i know is a little less common with some of our like one or two full barns but my big breeding facility is that you know, like to place the full alerts. We do that about two weeks out from foaling. So there's less of a chance for these girls to kind of rip those sensors out. All right, so your foaling kit. Luckily, we are in a beautiful retail facility that has a lot of these things. So if you are shopping today, here's a couple ideas of things that I like to put in my foaling kit. So I assemble this like in the past, I've used one of those little like grooming totes, um, but some things to keep handy, towels. No one is ever mad to have towels. Um, I recommend gloves. We're gonna talk about cleanliness when we get into the active foaling stage. Um, umbilical dip. So this is something where when I see your foal for the first time, I can help you know coach you on what I like to use to clean their little new belly button. Um, and, and we have a couple of different concoctions that we use for that. Uh, vet wrap for the tail, bandage or blunt end scissors, a thermometer, trash bags, we'll talk about that again soon. Um, cotton and gauze just for general use. Some people will keep like colostrum or milk replacers around in case they need them, which I hope none of you do. Um, and then, you know, a full blanket. So obviously it's four degrees out. <laughs> No one wants to be cold. They make nice little full blankets for the foals too. And then finally, a plan. And this is the big asterisk for this. I encourage all of you right now, when things are low stress, you don't have a young baby running around in your barn or a mare that's about to full tomorrow night, to come up with your plan, okay? 
Horses are beautiful creatures. They do a lot of great things naturally, but things happen. And so I encourage all of you when you're in a very low stress situation to come up with your plan. If that mare needs to go somewhere for like assisted birthing or if, heaven forbid she needs a C-section, is that in the cards for your mare? And I want you to like determine that now while life is good because there's nothing worse than it being two o'clock in the morning. You have no idea who to call. You have no idea where to go. And you're sitting there with an estimate for a C-section of like 10 to $12,000 right? You don't want to be in that situation. So talk to your veterinarians, like come up with what your plan is. Like if this happens, do I call you? If this happens, should I get the mare on the trailer and start driving? Come up with all of that now before things are hectic. And again, it's naturally 3.30 in the morning and cold out. Okay. All right. So another question people always ask me is about milk testing and looking at the mare's udder. And so you can see um, over here on the right, the little picture of little teat, um, that teat and the udder and the bag itself is going to start to fill up roughly three to four weeks before foaling. And again, that's a rough estimate. Some mares bag up four months <laughs> or four weeks. Some mares bag up at six weeks. Maidens, a lot of time horses, you know, horses that have never foaled before. That's you guys. Yeah. They don't have a bag that has been filled before. And so they can have like smaller teats. They may not bag up until a week before. And that's normal. Every mare is just a little bit different. But what they all will do fairly you know, repeatedly is something called waxing up. And so you can see here on the end, this is her little teat. This here is kind of really a thick, literally waxy substance that they'll start to secrete roughly anywhere between two to three days before foaling. I've seen mares wax up and not full for seven days. I've seen mares wax up and full the next night. So it's not completely repeatable, but it is certainly more of an indicator that like things are inevitable. Something else interesting that has more recently become kind of a, a star for some people to do is milk testing. And so there's two easy ways to do milk testing. The first is, I know I have these switched, but the first is calcium testing, which is where you physically test the amount of calcium in the milk. And there are commercially made kits. This is one of them called Predictafol, and there's one called Full Watch. And so you buy these kits and you express a little bit of the milk out of her teat, and then you take that and you can measure the amount of calcium. Even easier is this pH testing. And so you have to buy very specific pH tape, right? And this, me this measures pH, if you forget chemistry class from high school, this measures the acid and base kind of concentration of the milk. And so, you know, that's on a scale of, of larger scale than what we need to look at for foals or for mare milk. But if you can buy this smaller range, the 5.5 to 8 range paper, when a mare is making her milk, it's a little bit more basic. And so it's between seven to eight in the pH scale, roughly 12 to 24 hours before she foals, that acidity of the milk drops drastically. And so right before foaling, they say 12 to 24 hours, it gets down to 6.4. And so you see now why you would need this lesser range stuff because there's more shades of colors between the numbers. If you get the just regular pH paper, which has the full range, you're gonna be like out there using like the bare match a color paint thing to be like, is it seven or is it eight? <laughs> so get the limited range stuff. It's $9 a roll on Amazon and we'll get to you via prime delivery and it's easy to do. What I would encourage you and what I made a note here of, you only need a small amount of that secretions. Don't sit there and like milk out her whole tea and then be like, I've got this whole glass of milk and I'm going to dip the paper. You just need a little bit and then wash your hands before and after. Just like, you know, anything else, they can get bacterial infections in there and we don't want to cause more harm than good. So you just need a little drop and that's all you need. Put it on the paper and you can match it up to the little scale on the thing and see where she's at. So that's an easy way to do that. All right. Something that I'm going to touch on here and again in a little bit is her colostrum. That's their first milk that they make. And so the colostrum is this thick, yellow, really sticky substance um, that contains all of those proteins that are part of her, the mare's immune system that she's going to give to the foal. And so that is made about at month 10 and she keeps that in her bag until her little foal comes around. So when the foal is born, that's the first thing the foal ingests. And again, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But I wanted to put this in here so that you know, this is the reason we don't want to strip her teat out because if you get rid of all of her colostrum trying to figure out when she's going to fold, we're going to do more harm than good. So that's that first substance you're going to see. All right, we've hit the holy mecca. We're going to do folding now, okay? Does anybody have any questions over the first group of stuff that we covered? I know it's a lot. 
excellent. All right. So now we're going to go into the three stages of labor. And I put a disclaimer on here. You're at a foaling talk. There's going to be pictures of foaling. There's going to be pictures of animal reproductive parts. So if that offends you, just back off for a moment. But here we are at foaling. Okay. Three stages. Stage one, arguably the most frustrating part of this whole ordeal. This is what I love to call the hurry up and wait stage because essentially what you'll see, and like I just talked to you about, these mares when they're in late pregnancy are big. There's a lot of stuff crammed in their abdomen. They can be pretty crampy and a little bit uncomfortable. But stage one to me is usually very obvious. These mares are restless. These mares are irritated. Their uterus is starting to tone up and contract. Imagine having a Charlie horse, but in your whole abdomen. And they're walking around and kind of saying like, whoa, something is happening. And they're kind of figuring out where they're going to be. All right. I like to tell people this is normal. All right. When you see the mares and obviously this is where it gets tricky and I have notes about this, you know, determining if a mare is actually colicky or if this is just her about to have her full, it's tough. What I don't want you to do is be like, she's running around in the stall and run in there and grab her and, you know, try to calm her. Like this is just part of the process for them. And so as long as like you're in your foaling window and the mare isn't like obviously distressed, like throwing herself to the ground and uncomfortable, the pacing and the moving part of the process let her do it. All right. I tell people, turn the lights off, go in the house, have a cup of coffee, prepare yourself mentally, because this is going to take a while, one to four hours. I've seen mares do this for 20 minutes. I've seen mares run around their stall for three hours. It just kind of depends on the horse. Your maiden mare is probably going to be a little bit longer and she's going to be a little more frantic because she's confused. It's never happened to her before. A lot of these old brood mares that have had foals before are like, yep, this is it. <laughs> I know what's coming. So it just kind of depends. But I always tell people it's also up to you. You can see in these pictures, both of the mares have their tails wrapped. That is not a mandatory event. Um, it helps keep things a little cleaner. And obviously then you don't have a bunch of stuff in her tail. But just remember if you wrap her tail with vet wrap, as soon as the foals out, take that vet wrap off so we don't cause damage to her tail. But this is kind of your opening segment to foaling. All right, stage two, this is it, full is coming. This stage, the most important thing to take home from this is it should be short. Once the mare lays down and starts pushing, this should be over in roughly 20 to 30 minutes. So it starts, we technically call the start of stage two labor when her water breaks or this, what I've demonstrated here because it can kind of go either way, this whitish pearly white sac here is the amnion. So that's the inner layer that the foal is inside of when she's in the mare or the foal's in the mare. Sometimes that amnion ruptures and you see the water breaking. Sometimes it escapes out the cervix intact, which you can see here. And so you'll kind of see that white fluid filled sac that doesn't mean anything. It normally will rupture as the foal starts coming out. If you go, if you're in the stall with the mare and you see that, you can open it up. It's no big deal. But again, it usually opens on its own. But so that's where it kind of gets confusing is it starts once the foal starts coming out. The water breaking is the first kind of easy sign, but it doesn't always happen. And then, like I said, 15 to 30 minutes, it should be smooth. It should be continuous and she should always make forward progress. And sure, she may take a second and take a couple breaths and then go back to it. That's fine. But we'll talk about in a minute when you need to be calling me. And one of those things is if she is not continually making progress, you need to touch base with someone. All right. Normal foaling, the mare is doing her thing, does not be, need to be assisted. Okay. Everyone gets super excited. They're like, it's happening. Let me go in there. I'm going to help her pull it out. <laughs> okay. We are all as humans, very helpful creatures and we want to do what we need to, to help these girls full, but you can do more harm than good. If they're doing their thing and life is rocking on, let them do it. Okay. One thing that you do need to step in for absolutely is something called a red bag delivery, which tells you all you need to know, right? If you see a red bag, that is an emergency. You do not have time to pick up the phone and call me because it's already been happening like this for a moment until you saw it 
coming out of her vagina. But that red portion is actually her placenta that did not rupture for the foal to come out. And so what that means is that the placenta is detached from the uterus, right? And the placenta normally is what's transmitting nutrients, oxygen, all of that. It's separated early. And so the foal is not getting those things. And so essentially it is stuck inside a little sac and is not getting any nutrients or oxygen. And so you need to open that up so that the foal can normally be birthed and is getting those things. So that's why we put those blunt ended scissors in our foaling kit, because essentially I don't care where or how you do it. Well, I do care, but <laughs> what I want you to do is grab the placenta with your little gloved hands, lift it up away from anything underneath and away from the mare and cut into it. And then you can tear it open. It's going to feel a little barbaric, but you need to do that so that the foal can get oxygen. Okay. Mares with red bag deliveries, the foals can be prone to things, you know, there's conditions in foals when they don't get enough oxygen when they're being born. And so we should hear about you, you know, hear from you that this is happening. But in the moment, it is team birthing attendant that needs to open this up, okay? All right, a couple notes on fetal presentation, which is essentially our words for how the foal is coming out of the mare, because this is important for you to know, is that in a normal foaling, as you see here, the foal should superman out. So front legs extended and out, and the head should kind of be between them and coming all together. It is not necessarily abnormal um, or uncommon for what we call a malposition, meaning the foal's not in the right place as it comes out of the mare, or we get different appendages at different times. And so, you know, it's not always a necessity that these mares get assistance when the foals are malpositioned, but it definitely is something that you should check in with us about common malpositions are sometimes we get what we call a shoulder back where one of the arms is pulled back and so she's coming your foal's coming like this sometimes we get both legs but a head is turned back sometimes you get a breech full where all you see is a tail first and those are all you know reasons that you should check in with your veterinarian i've seen mares full malposition foals out just fine but sometimes they need assistance and so if you're calling me when the mare's been trying to fold the mare or fold the foal out in a bad position for 20 minutes right i could be at home because it's two o'clock in the morning i like to sleep so i could be at home in bed and you call me and say hi the foal's been trying to push for or the mare's been trying to push for 30 minutes and all i see is a tail well i needed to be there 30 minutes ago so if you notice that maybe the foal's not coming in the right direction just check in with me because I'd rather you call me back in 20 minutes and say hey she got it out because then I can put my pajamas back on and go back to bed but if I need to be on the road I'm already ahead of schedule okay so you'll hear me talk about a couple of times dystocia which is our latin derived term for a troubled birth and so a dystocia just means that the mare cannot full the full out appropriately and so uh, it can be as simple as the mare just needed some help with some pulling or it can be as complicated as the mare needs a cesarean section it's a broad term topic um, but when you're making your fulling kit i find it really important right like as your veterinarian yeah i can preg check the mare and i can vaccinate the mare but a lot of people can do that what i like to think is that i can be more of a consultant for you and help you come up with your plan if the mare is having a dystocia what do i need to do what's my timeline for getting a hold of you what's my timeline for making decisions where do i need to go things like that there are times where I may call, you may call me and say, hey, the mare, like I see two arms and a head, but the mare is not pushing as much as she should. And I may instruct you to help her by pulling the foal. And I'm going to give you instructions on how to do that appropriately. But those are things that we should talk about right before we get in that stressful situation. Like, hey, if you tell me to pull the foal, what should I do? And I'm happy. And that's one of my favorite things. You can ask Radine here is one of my breeding clients. And I stand in her barn and talk to her about things all day long. Sometimes she's like, please leave. <laughs> but, um, you know, those those are things that I want you to discuss with me before we get to that point so that when I give you those instructions you're not like oh god I have no idea what to do one thing I like to tell people is the most important part of this is the mare is already going to be you know worked up the hormones are flowing the foals coming things are contracting your job is to stay calm and kind of keep going with your plan and I always tell people that on the phone like just take a deep breath we're going to get through it but just stay calm and be clean that's the biggest thing I recommend gloves because you know, you can track things into the mare if you're putting your arms or your hands inside. And, and I just want you to be clean for the mare and for you because no one likes to be that dirty at three o'clock in the morning. Okay, this is the slide I want everyone to memorize before they go home. So yep, you can take out your phones, 
take pictures. Reasons that I need a phone call at three o'clock in the morning, okay? Reason number one is if stage one labor, meaning the mare is circling the stall, looks irritated, agitated, if that goes past four hours or if she seems distressed, like truly colicky, I need a phone call. Stage two labor, if that takes longer than 20 or 30 minutes, the mare is either pushing or not pushing, whatever the story is, if that's going too long, I need a phone call. 20 minutes, I'm already a little concerned, especially if, you know, she's been down, laying down, is pushing, you can see the contractions, because these girls, you know, they will lay there and squeeze with all their might. If you can see that and nothing's happening, I need a phone call. Because again, we may need to assess, like, is the foal in the wrong spot? Is something, you know, not in a good spot where she can foal? So those are reasons I need a call. One of the interesting things, that when I was a student, we kind of laughed about this because I always told you, well, if you get back legs or front legs first, someone should know. And I'm like, okay, you're standing there. How do you tell if it's a back leg or a front leg if you just get the foot, right? <laughs> they all look the same. <laughs> well, one of the little tricks is if the bottom of the foot is pointing up, it's usually a back leg, right? Because if you stretch your foot out, you get the bottom of your foot up. And so again, some of these mares can fold them out that way, but I still would like to know. And so um, something else I like to point out, foals when they're in the mare, right? If they had hard little feet like an adult horse, they would tear the mare up, right? And that would be unpleasant. So in the first like 24 hours of life, you will notice on the bottom of your foal's feet, looks like little octopus, octopus tentacles, like little finger-like projections. That's called the eponychium, and it's a little bit of a barrier so that the foal doesn't have a hard little hoof that can poke through the mare's uterus. And so I always tell people when you're looking at, like, if this is the picture you get, you're going to look at that and be like, that doesn't look like a normal horse foot at all. <laughs> and that's okay. But you can still certainly still see like the smooth front side of the hoof wall and then that kind of irregular bottom. So that's what I want you to look for. All right. And then the final part, uncommon but happens, is the full parts of the full, a leg, sometimes a head, can actually come through the mare's rectum. And so that at the time, you know, we need to rearrange things so that the full can be born, but that's a different kind of post foaling situation that we have to deal with. But at the time, if you see like a foot coming out of her rectum and then a foot coming out of her vagina, give me a call. I'll coach you with what to do. But occasionally it happens. Um, unfortunately, you know, there, there's a lot of muscle pushing and sometimes things go the wrong way. But again, please give us a call if that happens. All right. The last stage, stage three is the mare passing her fetal membrane, so her placenta, okay? This should be within three hours, so that's easy to remember. Stage three, three hours. The mare should expel her placenta, and usually what happens is, you know, she folds, the foals on the ground, it's gonna drag some of the fetal membranes out with it, and then she probably will stand up, and you'll see it hanging there, and then in a perfect world, in like 10 minutes as she's walking around, it plops out and your job is done. Sometimes these girls, especially in your maidens that have a smaller cervix because they haven't had that kind of repeat dilation from multiple pregnancies, sometimes it can take a little longer. You can use like baling twine and kind of tie it up if she's dragging it around and stepping on it, but it should be out completely within three hours. If it's not out within that three hours, that is also considered an emergency. Horses, as we all know, because we own and love them, are not the most intelligently designed creatures in the world. And so when they get these membranes left in their uterus, it makes this perfect little home for bacteria to set up shop and they can get nasty uterine infections. And so if that mare has kept her placenta in for longer than three hours, if it's five o'clock in the morning, I'm coming out there because we're going to lavage her uterus and try to get those fetal membranes to detach completely so that she can pass them and we can get all of that stuff out of her. Something important is, you know, because all of your mares are going to perfectly do what we want, <laughs> I want you to save the placenta. So if she drops her placenta, put your gloves on, go in the stall with your little trash bag, scoop that up and put it in the trash bag. I don't care if it's covered in bedding. You don't have to clean it off. Just put it on in there. Because when I come out to see you the next day for your new full exam, we're going to pull that placenta out and look at it and make sure that we've got all the parts and pieces out. Because if you think the whole placenta stuck in her is bad, even little tiny pieces, like I've lavaged mares where I pulled out a little like one inch by one inch piece of placenta, that can cause a hugely inflammatory reaction and still give these girls problems. So we want to check that placenta when we see you. And then finally, monitor your mares. 
these girls just went through a big ordeal. They pushed out a hundred pound full. Things can be a little swollen. Things can be a little painful. They can have tearing just like in human women. And so I just want you to keep an eye on them and make sure that they're not so wildly uncomfortable that we need to give them, you know, like a dose of an NSAID or something to help keep them comfortable. And that's usually pretty obvious. Sometimes these girls take a couple hours before they'll defecate for the first time after foaling. And it's just good to kind of know where they're at in their timeline so that we're making sure we're taking care of them if we need to. Okay, we just went through all the foaling stuff and everyone's usually like, foals on the ground, I'm going to bed, <laughs> which is nice, right? That's the perfect world. Um, what I want you to know is that, you know, the foaling stuff is the hard part, but there's a lot of little idiosyncrasies that come with post foaling mares that you should be aware of, okay? For my people that have made mares, this is their first time having a foal. They're going to have their foal and stand up and all of the hormones are gonna be racing, they're gonna be excited, and then they're gonna turn around and there's gonna be a small baby yelling at them that it's hungry <laughs> and wants to stand up, okay? This is a very, you know, we don't usually think about this in the, from the horse's eyes, but this is an emotional time for them, right? As best as we can kind of perceive that. And so I like to remind people that sometimes your lovely little child's horse has just had a foal. She may not act like you've expected her to act in the past. And what I mean by that is some of these girls get very excited and they're, they're prey animals, right? They're used to in the wild, that's their new foal, they need to protect it. So sometimes even though you've known her her entire life, she can act a little different when she's put, done foaling. And I just want you to be aware of that, you know. For those of you that are foaling one or two mares out and this is kind of a family affair, that's awesome. But I would not personally let like kids in the stall right after the mare has had her foal. It's a safety issue and I want all of you to be safe. That's the most important part of this, right? So when you're going in the stall and you're handling the mares after they're foaling, please, 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 please put a lead rope and a halter on the mare. Make sure there is one person who is dedicated to attending to the mare and is not like holding the mare, you know, like we all do as horse people. <laughs> You've like got the lead rope thrown over her neck and you're like doing 500 things. Please don't do that. Like be safe, have someone attending to the mare and make sure we're aware of who's in the stall and who's where and where the foal is. You know, I've seen very experienced horse handlers get kicked by brood mares because they were in there and the brood mare was doing fine, but then they stepped in the wrong spot. It happens. So please just be safe. Um, I also like to tell people stress predisposes these mares to issues. One time when I was working in New York, I got a phone call about a foal that was sick. So I get there, the foal was born like eight hours ago. I drive out there, okay? I'm sitting there and the foal is sitting in the middle of a pasture and the mare is running circles around the foal because it was out in a pasture with six other horses. So what do you think the mare is doing? right? Warding off everyone else. So while the mare is running everyone else away, the foal is sitting in the middle of the pasture not getting uh, stimulated to stand up, not nursing, right? Which like the mare's doing her job and she's like, go me, I'm protecting my foal. <laughs> but the foal's not getting what it needs. And so stress predisposes these mares to doing things outside of their normal realm of activities. And so give her the time, turn the lights off, walk away. Like as long as the mare is doing okay and the foal's fine and they're bonding and things are happening, let them have their time. Cause this is a huge, like window where if we, you know, stimulate them too much or stress them too much, the other goofy things can happen. It's just not worth it. So the first couple hours of life, once you've ensured that like life is good, you've gathered your little placenta up and the full standing up, let them have their time. Alrighty. Any questions from here? We're doing good. We're chugging right along. Okay. So other important things, this is another easy one to take home, are your new foal milestones. So within like the first six hours of life, um, the foals should follow this one, two, three rule. So usually what happens, foals out, the mare is gonna sit there and be like, hey, what just happened? Oh, there's a foal. And she's gonna turn around, some of them stand up, some of them stay laying down, just depends. She's gonna lick the foal to dry it off. You don't have to go in there, I just told you to have towels. You don't have to go in there with the towels and like scrub the foal off that's the mare's job. She's going to get to know it, lick it, dry it. Okay. And then they should follow the one, two, three rule. All right. One, the full should stand within one hour of life. Sometimes it's 50 minutes. Sometimes it's an hour and 10 minutes, but like if we're past an hour and a half, then we need to kind of do some things, but the full should stand within the first hour of life. The foal should nurse within the first two hours of life. And miraculously, a lot of times these little foals will stand up and they'll just kind of weasel their way back there and latch on and go. But again, sometimes it takes them a little longer. The mares are spinning in circles like, who are you? Why are you in my house? So it just kind of depends, but within two hours. 
And then finally, the placenta should be passed and the foal should urinate and defecate within three hours. And the urinate and defecate thing, I'm a little looser on the timeline there because sometimes it can take up to like six hours, but we should at least be keeping track because as we'll cover, there's some issues with, you know, foals that don't urinate and defecate. So just keep an eye. All right, if the foals do not follow the one, two, three rule, it's time to call. Because again, those first like six, eight to 12 hours are a very important window for us, okay? So again, this is where I stress giving them time. You know, you can do all this from outside the stall, just keep an eye. Some people will keep a little notebook and kind of monitor what times things happen. So when I show up the next morning and say, how did things go? You can be like, well, look, we were birthed at 2.30, we were standing at 3.10, and I'm like, you're awesome, thanks for writing all that down. So you can do that and it's easy. Um, if the foal stands up and is nursing, then I take my little umbilical dip, get in there and dip its little umbilicus, and then we're going back inside to get a few hours of sleep. Like I said, once you kind of assume that the mare and the foal are doing all their things, that's their time to kind of get to know each other. And then like I said, if the mare doesn't follow the, or the foal doesn't follow the one, two, three rule, or if the mare just seems really agitated and is not like settling to let the foal, you know, nurse and do things, just give us a call. Because again, sometimes we just have to kind of help them out, calm things down. All right, we're in the last section. So I just wanted to touch a couple, you know, points on some pregnancy complications. So you know we're kind of backtracking now from the from having the foal, but some things to be aware of that can cause issues with foalings and mares. The first thing is placentitis, which we'll touch on. I have a whole other slide on it. Um, obviously abortions. We talked about herpes abortions earlier. Then there are other things that can cause abortion like maternal issues or fetal issues. Uh, twin pregnancies, which hopefully we've alleviated that at your first couple of preg checks. And then the last thing I'll touch on is prolonged pregnancy. So the first one every mare owner should be aware of, which is placentitis. This essentially just means inflammation of the placenta or the lining that its job is to transmit all of the oxygen and nutrients and blood to the foal. And so essentially these girls can get what we call an ascending infection, meaning an infection that tracks up her vagina and through her cervix and can infect the placenta. Um, and it can cause thickening of that placenta and the placenta can't do its job anymore. Early signs of that condition are you know, inappropriate udder development, meaning at like five months the mare develops an udder, that's very abnormal. And so we should hear about that. Occasionally you'll get mares with vulvar discharge, although that's not 100%. And then sometimes there'll be, you know, you can actually see if, if you don't catch this in time, the mares will abort and the placenta is like thick and brown and, and not, you know, not conducive to doing its job. This requires me to come out and ultrasound it and then, you know, we can start these guys on pretty aggressive treatment early. And I would say in most cases we have good luck treating it and keeping the mares to pregnancy, although it can cause abortion in some horses. And then finally, some of the other things that cause abortions that we talked about are, are pregnancy issues. Twins, you know, everyone loves to see the videos on Facebook of mares that have two healthy twins and that's incredible. Unfortunately for us, that is usually statistically not the case. You know, twin pregnancies are hard. The mare, you know, for the mare to feed two fetuses, it's hard to birth two normally sized functional fetuses. And then the foals, usually what happens is the mare doesn't even make enough milk to feed two babies. And so I wish we could, you know, accomplish that, but sometimes it's not possible. But like I said, we should catch those guys at your early preg checks. Fetal abnormality, so again, kind of your zebras, but you know, I've seen foals born with six legs. <laughs> I've seen foals born with their intestines outside of their body. It just kind of depends, but those are issues, again, that a, a mare may abort. Um, infection we talked about. Hydrops is another one where she overproduces the fluid inside of the sac. Um, Prepubic tendon rupture. So these mares can actually, the structure that holds their abdomen together, they can rupture the tendons if they have a big pregnancy. And so you'll see like a weird change in your mare's kind of abdominal silhouette. Uh, uterine and umbilical cord torsion, again, those are kind of not very common, but happen. And then, <laughs> we got an assistant. Fescue toxicity, which is um, a type of grass that actually overproduces a chemical that essentially stops the mares from producing milk and getting signals that she needs to birth. And so that causes like the prolonged pregnancy and the pregnancies where the mares don't produce enough milk once the foal's born. So if you're kind of getting past your foaling date, you notice the mare doesn't really have a bag, and you're like, oh, this just doesn't seem normal, just give us a call. It's an easy thing to look at and assess and get them started on the appropriate medications. All right, so then finally we get to the new foal exam. So most pregnancies, I say eight, roughly 80% of foals are born between the hours of one and 5 a.m. 
lucky you guys. <laughs> okay. So, you know, everyone wants to call us, you know, on a normal foaling and be like, Hey, the foal's out. And um, it's two o'clock in the morning. I'm like asleep on the phone. Like, okay, is it standing? Yeah, it's standing. Did it nurse? Yeah, it nursed. Okay. Is the mare okay? Yeah, the mare's fine. All right. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> so if, if all goes well, we want a phone call from you when our clinic opens at eight o'clock to say, Hey, my mare had her full last night. Life is good. We're, you know, we need our new full exam today. So we put you in our schedule, we drive out to you. And essentially my job at your new full exam is to look for things, you know, assess the mare and assess the full and make sure both are doing okay post-pregnancy. Some of the things that we look at are orthopedic exam. So we make sure, you know, all four legs are attached and pointing in the right direction. <laughs> <clears throat> we'll feel their ribs and make sure none of their ribs are fractured. That can happen. You know, these girls have big uteruses are strong. Sometimes they can kind of push things and fracture their ribs. We'll check their heart and lungs and listen for, you know, abnormalities that may occur that resolve on their own or may not. We'll check their eyes for things like congenital cataracts. Um, we'll check their palate. You know, foals get cleft palates just like human babies do, and so we'll feel for that. We'll check their little belly button and help you kind of say, hey, here's your goal for the next couple weeks with their belly button and keeping that clean and dry. And then we will also look for what we call failure of passive transfer, which I'll talk about next, where making sure these foals got that first milk or the colostrum from the mares and therefore have their passive uh, immune system. And then finally, we check the mares. Everyone forgets about the mares, right? Babies are cute, <laughs> but we always check the mares. We'll do a physical on her and make sure that, you know, she didn't have any issues with foaling and that she's doing okay too. And so this is another, you know, big thing from this presentation, which I hope that like none of you guys have to deal with this because it's not fun, but something called failure of passive transfer. So passive transfer describes how the mare passively gives an immune system to the foal through her milk and her colostrum. And so when that process doesn't happen appropriately, the foals are susceptible to infections and issues with their, their development because they didn't receive that kind of first set of their immune system. And so these foals are incredible little creatures in what they do in their first couple of hours of life, but they're also very delicate. And so if they don't have that kind of first defense line from the mares, they can be prone to these things that are causing, you know, what could be small in an adult mare, but turn into huge problems in the foals. And so we will check for this when we come see them. Uh, and the timeline, you know, why we talk about the one, two, three rule and why all the timing is important is because of a very, to me, incredible phenomenon where in the first like eight to 12 hours of life, the foals GI tract is actually designed to when it consumes the milk and the colostrum to let those antibodies from the milk and the colostrum come through the wall of intestine and then the foal absorbs them systemically. Unfortunately for us, because I would love that that was open for a little while longer, gave me a couple more hours. After like 12 hours, the GI tract rapidly use, loses its ability to do that. And so if that foal hasn't ingested the colostrum and the immune system from the mare at 12 hours, we have to physically give the foal an immune system. So that's what you see here, you know, in this photo, they're running the foal a liter of plasma, which is, you know, if you talk about the blood that's flowing through all of our veins, the plasma is the part that's not the red blood cells. And that is what contains your immune system and things and so we can actually collect plasma from adult horses and give it to the foals if they don't receive their immune system from mom but that's something that we have to catch that early on because if we don't identify those foals that maybe didn't get that immune system they need this plasma in the first 12 to 24 hours of life or again that window for them being susceptible to things is wide open and something I didn't touch on, we luckily have um, a stall side test that we can actually pull a little bit of blood from them and measure if they did get that immune system. And so it's something we can, you know, check for on the farm before we leave and then the foal gets sick. So that's nice. All right. Again, we just touched on this. If the foals don't get the immune system from mom, it's an emergency. There are a couple of products that are out there that are colostrum replacers. Unfortunately, the research behind them to say that they provide enough of an immune system for the foal and a quality immune system is just not there. And so we prefer that we run them plasma and give it to them parenterally or through their veins so we know they got it and they got a quality one. There is a difference, everyone confuses this. Colostrum replacer and milk replacer are two different things. So it's like every square is a rectangle. Colostrum is milk, but not all milk is colostrum. And so like, you know, Buckeye makes their awesome product Mare's Match, which is a milk supplement, but you can't give that in the beginning and get the same immune system that you would get from colostrum. So it's important to know the difference. 
all right and then again we can do these you know on the farm we can take care of these foals on the farm but they they require a lot of monitoring to make sure that they don't get any complications all right we're in the last section we're in the home stretch does anyone have any questions so far all right then here we go so just a couple of full emergencies that i want you guys to be aware of so that you can be better at identifying these things early on and so we can do a better job of helping your foals the first one is called a dummy foal, which is, you know, we should, we should really rebrand that because it's, it's not nice to call the foals dummies. But essentially what happens is, is that these foals don't follow their normal milestones. And a lot of times it can be as kind of vague as like the foals just don't look right. Like they're just kind of wandering around the stall. They don't really do normal foal things. And it can be as obvious as like these foals don't stand up in an hour. They don't nurse. So the, the like the um, description of their condition is very broad. But essentially what happens is, is these foals, it's called neonatal, meaning new life, maladjustment syndrome. So they just don't adjust to life, right? Sometimes I feel like I have that. <laughs> so these guys don't follow their milestones and they just need a little help kind of perking up. And again, it can be as simple as something that we manage out on your farm by giving them some fluids and kind of bolstering them up to some of these are very serious and end up needing hospitalization. So it just kind of depends on their symptoms, how long it's been going on, you know, and again, sometimes these are ones that we miss that didn't get the, that colostrum in their immune system. And so they require antibiotics and other things. So again, if you can identify these foals that aren't following their milestones, you're already ahead of the game. All right, another little one, meconium impaction. So when the foal is in its mom's uterus for 11 to 12 months, where does the poop go? <laughs> it stays in the foal. And so when they're born, they're going to pass all of that kind of cellular debris and things from production um, called their meconium. And so that's like their first feces. And so the meconium can have brought, ranges in its appearance, but this is a pretty good first picture. So it's usually dark, a little pebbly. Sometimes it's a little mixed in appearance, um, but essentially they have to pass this within the first, you know, six hours of life. Sometimes they won't because it can be firm and just, you know, gets kind of stopped up uh, and they just need a little bit of assistance passing it. But the earliest indicator of this is these foals are going to act colicky. One of the biggest things is that they're going to posture like they have to defecate but can't. So that's this foal right here. So if they're walking around with their little tail up and they're kind of like, woo, that's a foal that has a meconium impaction. And so again, we can usually coach you through managing these on the farm. Sometimes they need like repeat enemas from me, but they can be as simple as something that you can help the foals with with an enema. But again, these guys need to be addressed sooner because they can't sit there and not be able to poop. Okay. Next, we have orthopedic disease. Fairly common. Again, I'm not going to dive too far into this because I probably could give you a whole presentation on just this. But essentially, when the orthopedic, you know, system of the horse or the foal, um, they're crammed in a little uterus <laughs> for a long time. And so sometimes the tendons and ligaments don't appropriately adjust to, you know, their space or the anatomy. And so there's essentially two, or three major types of orthopedic disease. The first one is contracture, which you see in these first two photos. The ligaments are contracted, which kind of causes that upright and kind of flexed position. There's laxity, which is what we have over here on the right, where essentially they're too stretchy and so everything kind of sinks. And then the third I don't have a picture of, but it's called angular limb deformities, meaning the legs point in directions or, you know, sometimes it's your horses that are towed out or towed in. And so, you know, treatment depends on what it is. If you can catch these early, we can do a better job. I would say, you know, looking at, at foals with these conditions, contracture needs more intense kind of recognition and management than laxity does. A lot of times laxity, the foals just need a little exercise and things spring right up. But again, we should talk about it so that we can help you kind of come up with a plan and a goal for them. Diarrhea. <laughs> the last part is a lot of poop talk, but diarrhea and foals, tons of causes, virus, bacteria. One of the most common ones that again, everyone should know about is called full heat diarrhea where essentially once the mare has the foal and she starts cycling again, it can change the kind of bugs that live in her GI tract. And in case you guys didn't know this, the foals, especially in the first month or two of life, are going to eat the mare's feces. And that is how they kind of set up their GI tract for, for the bacteria that live there. And so when the mare starts cycling again and those bugs kind of change in her feces and then the foal picks them up and it changes them full, it can cause this what we call full heat diarrhea. Those foals are nursing, running around the stall. They don't know they have diarrhea. They don't have a fever. That's usually, you know, we give them a little bit of probiotics and some nursing care and keep them going. 
foals that have diarrhea that like we need to aggressively manage are you know dumpy foals not nursing sad have a fever those are two different kinds of diarrhea but again they can be really hard even for me to discern and so we have to do a hands-on exam for these guys so if you notice loose looser stool and foals give us a call normal foal feces can be anywhere from like formed kind of like what people think of dog feces um, up to like pasty feces but if you notice this like caked bum appearance or sometimes the really watery diarrheas the foal won't have anything on their hind end but their tail just looks like someone dunked it in a bucket of water that's like an early indicator we need a phone call All right foals with diarrhea can lose a lot of nutrients and and, and the um, electrolytes in their feces and so if you notice this again it's better to be kind of more aggressive about identifying it than just be like oh we'll see if it clears up all right colic we all know colics in adult horses which can just look a little uncomfortable in foals it can be a little harder to discern right because is the foal running around the stall like a mad person because it's colicking or because it's a baby horse that has a lot of energy but one of the big things is foals really don't lay on their backs. They can lay on their sides. They'll lay like sternally where they're kind of sitting up. But if they roll up on their backs and they're sticking their little legs out, that's a colicky foal. Again, I could give you a whole presentation on foal colics. We won't do that today. But know that if your foal is colicky, there's a lot of causes. We need a phone call. All right, this is our last slide, folks. So now that you have a foal, and you're there, the mare's happy, it's got its new full exam, life is good, where do we go from there? All right, for the first couple weeks of life, I recommend taking your foal's temperature, you know, talk to your veterinarian on, on learning how to do basic full handling so that you can safely do that. Um, I recommend that you dip their umbilicus two to three times a day for the first one to two week of life, depending kind of on how the umbilicus dries up and you know, they will, they'll shrivel up and eventually fall off. We like to monitor the full nurses, and I wanna again, put a little asterisk in your head. Nursing does not just mean that the full walks back to the udder. I want you to visualize the full latching on and swallowing milk. Because a lot of times these foals, especially the dummy foals, will kind of wander back there and be like, I feel like I should be here for something. And they'll root around, but they don't actually nurse. But if you're just kind of cruising by and be like, yeah, it's nursing, you'll miss that. So make sure you visualize that full getting up to the tee, latching on and suckling and swallowing. And then again, the best that you guys can do to help me help you is early detection. So, you know, I kind of joke, we don't have to be helicopter moms, but you know, just keeping an eye. A lot of times foals, some things can be slight and it, the better you are at catching them, the better we can help you. I'm never mad to take a phone call and say, yeah, you know, it sounds maybe a little different for the foal. Let's keep an eye. I'm happy to coach you that way. You know, it doesn't mean that we have to come out and see the foal every time, but it's better just for us to be on the same page and communicate so we can help you. All right, and then just keep an eye on the mare. A lot of times these girls do their job just fine. Sometimes they need a little help in segments, but again, they're usually pretty honest, okay? So that's the whole shebang, folks. <laughs> so obviously, you know, our job um, in, in kind of my side of the veterinary thing is to, to help you guys get set up to have a healthy mare and a healthy foal, and that's what we're here for. Um, if any of you guys, you know, don't feel like you have a good relationship, we're happy to, even if it's like, hey, my mare's supposed to full next week, you know, we're happy to be resources for you. Um, and I know Big D's has, they've set up a little flash sale on mare and full stuff. You know, they've got a lot of good things back in their healthcare section. So everyone's here to help support you guys. But at this point, I'll take any questions if anyone has come up with any. I know you just got a lot of information in an hour, but I'll take any questions. Yes. Yeah, so she asked about having like bottles and, and the nipple supplies at home. Um, I would say that it's never a bad thing to have them because of course you always want one when you don't have it. Um, I would say that they can be difficult, like not the foals that are going to have issues like suckling and consuming the milk, like usually that's stemming from another issue. So like, yes, if you have one, I can coach you on how to use it, but it still sometimes means that I need to come out and assess the foal and we can, you know, get you set up on a better plan then. But it never hurts to have one. <laughs> How's that for a vague answer? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Sure. Yeah, great question. Um, I think that's very dependent on the mares a lot of times. You know, I typically say that, like, I leave the mares in foals stalled for like 24 to 48 hours just to make sure that, like, the mare doesn't have a chance to. <laughs> 
peace out and leave the fold. Especially your maidens, if they're not like, oh, I'm supposed to take care of this. <laughs> they can be kind of goofy about that. So I leave them stalled for like two days and then I'll start doing like small paddocks. So like round pen turnout is perfect. Or if you have like an indoor or something like that. But once the foals, as long as the weather conditions are okay, like I wouldn't put a full out today <laughs> because I might more, maybe with a little blankie on, but um, you know, as long as the weather conditions are okay and you have the appropriate fencing and things, the mares can and foals can start going out, you know, within like the first week. Um, I'm usually very cautious about turning the mares and foals out with like big herds, especially if it's like geldings and, you know, other horses that don't have foals, just because a lot of times like they can, you know, come over and like investigate the foal and they're a little rough. And so I usually will reserve like that kind of turnout for like a couple months, honestly, just to be safe because I'm, <laughs> it makes me nervous, but yeah. You're welcome. Can you talk a little bit about foaling monitors, what's available out there? And sure. So, and things like that. And they can tell if she's standing or recumbent. And so those are a little less sensitive, right? Because like you can lay down <laughs> and be down and rolling for other reasons. But um, those are available too. I don't have any experience with those systems. I've used mostly like the full alerts and things like that. But those are the ones that I'm aware of. You're welcome. Yeah, ooh, online. Um, have you seen cases when foals are unable to drink mother's milk due to inca incompatible blood types or something similar to this issue? Yeah, so she asked about the foals can't drink the mare's milk because of incompatibilities. Um, the most common thing is a condition called neonatal isoerythrolysis, which is like vegetable alphabet soup. Um, but essentially more common in thoroughbreds and standard bred mares because of the lineage breeding that we do. But essentially what it is, is the, it's often we incriminate the stallions, no offense stallions, but um, the mare starts producing, uh, has antibodies for the stallion's blood type, right? And I told you guys that like we give her vaccine and those antibodies get in the colostrum, but the foal gets all of the antibodies the mare makes. And so part of those antibodies can be for different blood types. And so then when the foal is born and maybe it has the stallion's blood type, it consumes the colostrum from the mare with those antibodies. And so then essentially the immune system that the foal just took in starts attacking the foal's blood. And so then you have issues like those foals um, usually, you know, thrive in the first couple hours of life, but then start to go downhill. You'll see jaundice where you get like yellowing of the eyes and of the gums and things like that. So it's a common condition in those populations of horses. Uh, and there is a test for it. Like you, know, you talked about having a thoroughbred broodmare farm, they can actually pull blood from the mare and send it out for testing and identify those mares. And the treatment is just that, you know, we, we muzzle the foals uh, for the first couple, you know, 24 to 48 hours of life. We run them the plasma that we talked about so that we know they get an immune system, but not one that they're going to react to. And then once their gut has closed, you know, we talked about in 12 hours the gut closes, they can go back to drinking the mare's milk because then they can't get those antibodies. So, yes, it is a thing. <laughs> Anything else? Perfect. All right. Thank you guys so much for your time. I hope you guys got something out of it. I'll hang out for a little bit if you have more questions.